All right, thanks everyone. Um, we're almost there with our morning session. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the fundamentals of species descriptions. And I just want to emphasize again, you've heard this, but I want to go through it again with the different kinds of data to emphasize that it all starts with the diagnosis. And if you can master this part, then I basically think everything else will flow. I think if you can get the, the diagnosis, and again, the definition of that universe of taxa, the relevant species to which you'll compare your putative new species, um, everything else can flow in terms of writing the manuscript. So uh, you've heard some of this stuff before. Species descriptions are based on this process of diagnosing new species. And that new species is diagnosing compared to the relevant set of previously described taxa, that universe of the species out there that are important for your description. And here's the way I think about it. These are the different, I mean, you've heard a couple different options and different taxa present different challenges. But for me, with amphibians and reptiles, I, these are the things that I consider comparing my, my suspected new species to. To the congeners, which is a term for the other taxa that are in the same genus, for a Linnaean hierarchical system. Um, the physically or, or morphologically or phenotypically most similar taxa, the things that look like the new species. Um, the geographically proximate species, the ones that are nearby, that are in the same general area. Species that may co-occur at the same site. And then basically this is the question you have to ask yourself. What are the other species with which your new species can be possibly can be confused? And that's the really practical thing that is really important for us. What are the other species that if a biologist had your new species and another, another a, a sample of other taxa, which are the ones with which it could be confused? And you want to pick the ones that are most similar to it in terms of geography and, and physical characteristics and ecology and everything so that you can really diagnose it in a fine way from the most relevant taxa, which are the ones that are most similar to it or the ones with which it can be confused. Okay, and of course that choice of, of relevant comparisons is just up to you and there's no right answer. So, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the kinds of data um, in amphibians and reptile systematics. You can diagnose taxa with mensural data, which are measurements, um, and you, these data can be um, sort of secondarily um, transformed, or, or you could basically you can um, diagnose taxa with um, derivations of these data, things like size-related characters of the taxa, or things like proportions, like ratios of head width to body width, things like that. So those are all kinds of mensural data. And then today, for this next part, since Blackburn already talked about that a little bit, and so did Town, I want to talk about meristic data, which are discrete characters and scale counts in the case of reptiles. And again, for, in terms of diagnosing something, we're thinking about the most relevant taxa, the ones with which it can be confused, and we're looking for non-overlapping ranges of character states. Because if you can show that you sampled a population or, or measured multiple individuals, and tax on A doesn't overlap with taxon B with respect to a couple characters, then your new species is what we call diagnosable. And that's really what it takes to prove it to the international community that you have a new species. Okay, so here are some examples. We're, again, we're focusing on trying to find non-overlapping ranges of character states. So here's one where we use proportional data. The head width divided by snout vent length, so that's the relative head size, in species A is 0.39 to 0.44, whereas in species B, it's 0.49 to 0.55. See how these two ranges don't overlap? They don't overlap with each other. They're separate. If you plotted history, frequency distributions or something, or the size of these on a graph, these two ranges, those two characters don't overlap. That's a non-overlapping character state. That's what we're looking for. Here's another one, just raw data. Tail length of species A is 22.4 to 30.2 millimeters, and the tail length in species B is 39 to 52 millimeters. Those are non-overlapping character states, and that's, that's gold for describing new species. That's what you're looking for, is things that are obviously different, and the ranges don't overlap with each other. Here's one, in, and we're talking about meristic counts, meristic data, which are scale counts. I'm using technical terms, but we're, we're really thinking about things that you can count, discrete quantities. Vertebral scale rows, when you're counting the scales down the back of a skinked lizard, in species A, this species, you measure 10 of them, and they range from 66 to 75. And in this species, species B, they range from 90 to 101. Again, those are non-overlapping character states in all three examples. And those are exactly the type of characters that we look for. And we try to pile up as many of these types of things to prove, to provide evidence for our diagnosability of a new species. And, um, and this is the real important thing here is that you, when you do this, is that you're focusing on a range of, of intraspecific within species variation. 
And what we're trying to show is that in species A versus species P, that intraspecific variation within a species doesn't overlap. So this just gets back to the importance of a sample size and us not focusing whenever possible on single species. But if, if we can have 10 specimens in our hand or better yet 25 or 30 specimens in our sample and we measure them or we count scales on all of them and they don't overlap like this, that's really strong evidence that you have a new species. And that's not rocket science. That's just having a couple specimens in one jar, a couple specimens in the other jar and counting scales down their back. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, some other examples here. Now we're going to get into other ways in which you can quantify characters. And so here's some examples. Species A is light brown, whereas species, green, species B is green with bright orange spots. Those are, you know, there's nothing wrong with very brief color descriptions like that if they're really meaningful. And if you have a, a jar of specimens or 25 individuals in one population, 25 in the other, and you can assess that variation, you can show that 25 specimens in this population are brown and 25 specimens in that population are bright green with bright orange spots, that's, there's, that's a perfectly good character state difference. That's non-overlapping ranges of color variation. Nothing wrong with that, right? That's, uh, there's nothing wrong with color characters. In fact, there's nothing about any one type of character difference that's better than any other type of character difference. Anything that's real and that you can assess as fixed in a population is a perfectly good diagnostic character. Here's another one. Species A has enlarged nuchal scales. So here are the interparietal scales, the parietal scales, and then these are nuchal scales that run behind the head here. And you can see these enlarged scales, whereas species B does not. Here's the parietal, here's the parietal, enlarged nuchals, no enlarged nuchals. And those are really good. If you assess a whole sample of populations of these lizards and you show that all of the individuals in the population have one of these character states and all in the population has the other, that's a diagnostic character. Uh, Dave already mentioned things like expansion of toe pads, and so this is a perfect example of a frog that has a broadly expanded toe pad and finger pad and one that doesn't. And I'll move forward since we already heard about that. Here's some other fixed character states in reptiles. This is a species of a mysterious species of snake from the Philippines, and you can see in one species it has a plain venter. The ventral side of the body is, is uniform, and then in this one it has a black stripe right down the middle. And across a range of variation, that was a fixed character. And that's a perfectly good character state to distinguish one species from the other. Here's another example in that same population. This one had squared off parietal scales at the back of the head, and this one had a notch with an interparietal scale in between. And I found that in six, six specimens of one and 22 specimens of the other, and they were never varied, and I was perfectly comfortable with that being a diagnostic character. Here's another, so these are examples of good characters because you can see them. And because, uh, and what I like about these illustrations, these figures, whether you draw it, and this is not a very particularly good scientific illustration, but I could draw it such that you could see the variation. Um, I think that's good as long as you can see what the character is. And here's a good one. The photograph was sufficient to see that, yes, you can see that there's a black stripe down that, that snake's ventral, ventral surface. That's all that's important is that you, that you show the reader what the character is and what the differences are, and then the reader can evaluate it for themselves. What I don't like are descriptions like this, and these are figures that I've taken right out of some papers that were published last year, where um, I'm, I've crossed off the name of the species and the author's name so that they won't get back to anybody here, but this says dorsal tubercles of the holotype. Well, I can see some tubercles there, but on this side of the body, I can't see anything, right? So I can't count those, and you know, that's, that's, that's not, you, if those are diagnostic characters as the reader, I can't see them, I can't assess them, because the photography is so bad. Here's one that says caudal dorsum without tubercles, and actually I can see some tubercles on it. So it doesn't make any sense to me. Like it's wrong, and it's all dark. Here's one where uh, the ventral scales of the, of the chin of the gecko, I can't see anything, right? So figures that don't show the diagnostic character states aren't helpful, and they're not gonna be, in my mind, this is a paper that should have been rejected. It should have never been published. Here's another one that showed ranges of, and you can see it in the PDF that is gonna be distributed, ranges of uh, meristic data variation in, a, in dorsal, ventral, and dorsal, ventral head scales of this lizard, and you can see how you can't see anything in that figure. So, I mean, this is pretty self-evident, and it's not very high-tech, but the point is, is that the good diagnostic illustrations often are the pretty ones that are, that are made by very talented scientific illustrators, but they don't have to be. They can really be simple as long as they show the diagnostic characters. So here's a case, I've just shown you a couple. Here's a weird, these are lizards that hadn't been studied before and a former graduate student of mine focused on, um, so you can tell the difference between this species and that species, right? This one has five toes and that one only has four and two of them are really long. 
And that's not something that anyone had ever described before, and we just found this by looking at the lizards and devised, and devised a couple diagnostic character states by just focusing on that. And I guess the point here when you're doing this is just to look at the specimens and look at the specimens and look at the specimens until you start seeing differences and then see if those differences hold across the population. Here's one that we found. This is the post-mental scale, the mental scale and the post-mental scale. And what we showed was that these chin shields right here touch each other in this species, but don't touch each other in that species. And that wasn't a character state that had ever been described by biologists, at least not in this group of lizards. Um, but we just found it by staring at them and staring at them until we realized that was a difference between the populations. And there's a few more up there. I won't go into too much detail. Here's one, um, just very simple. This is a frog, again, we named Citrinospilus. It's one that we already talked about. Citrin means yellow and spilus means spots. So this is one species and these things are the new species. And I like this one because it shows a wide range of variation. And these things have giant spots and these ones have little ones. But across our whole sample, these frogs here all were sort of reddish brown with various sizes and ranges of yellow spots on their flanks. And the, the previously described species was just solid green. And those are really simple things that you can see with the eye and, and you can show the reader just with photographs. One more example, I think, and then we'll move on. Um, so uh, this, these are geckos, and some of the types of characters that we focus on in geckos are, um, this is a species um, from, of gecko, of Luparosaurus from the Philippines. And you can see things like in the previously described species, they had giant and large scales here on the neck and a really small ear opening, auricular opening. And this one has no enlarged scales on the neck and a giant auricular opening. And you can see those regions on the, the side of the, the head there. And so we just made those up, you know, enlarged, um, tubercular scales on the neck and a round, enlarged auricular opening versus a very small slit-like opening there. And that those are just things that we hadn't seen in the literature before, but by eyeballing the specimen, we could find the differences. Um, and, you know, if you, if you show and illust uh, illustrate a character like this, th what this is what you want, is you want the reader to be able to, to verify your, your diagnostic characters. So in this figure, you can count the numbers of scales on the ventral side of the toes, and the reader doesn't have to believe us, the reader can do it themselves. And that's the idea with, with diagnosing char diagnosable character states and trying to illustrate your characters. Okay, so how do we summarize all this and how does this actually find its way to us writing a species description? And I think, as I said, if you can get the diagnosis, everything else will flow. And so here's a simple example of a diagnosis table for some real data for some real frogs. And um, these are the um, frogs of the genus Platymantis. And we've just summarized a couple different things that I, we, you've heard between Dave and I, we've heard both of us talk about. Body size, the shape of the toe discs, tubercles, whether they have flank spots on the body, skin of dorsal, fo dorsal folds, and something about the mating call. And so now take a look at this. This is really what um, the first step, for me at least, in writing a species description is coming up with this table, which has a figure legend that says, distribution of diagnostic character states across the relevant taxa and the new species. And if you, can, if you can show that and summarize it all in a table like this, you basically can write this, the species description, the diagnosis and the comparison sections around this table. So if, this is the, basically a first, a first starting point because once you have this, then everything else flows. So look at these things here. Body size in the new species, 23.2 to 27.8. See how that doesn't overlap with any of these other, this is body size in the males. See how that doesn't overlap? This is a case where I can say that the body size of the new species is smaller than its most, uh, its relevant congeners, its relevant uh, related species. And then often diagnoses take the form of what you're looking at right now, which is a combination of character states that either do diagnose the species for taxon A, but maybe they don't diagnose the species for taxon, for its relevant taxon B. So here's toe discs. In this species, it has expanded toe, pi toe pads that distinguish it from Platymantis insulatus and Platymantis spileus, but they don't different distinguish it from, from Platymantis paengi. See how, because this one has expanded toe pads and this one does, but these others don't. So in that case, you know, I can say that the toe pads distinguish the new species from these two taxa, but not that one. However, if we just keep going, tubercles are absent, and this is a great way to do it. This makes it really simple. If you try to describe your characters in terms of something that can be scored as present or absent, minus or plus. And so a lot of these tables just have minuses and pluses in them to indicate absent or present. So, 
tubercles on the back, tubercles on the dorsum, absent, absent, present here, absent. So that, that, whoops, sorry, that distinguishes, in this case, that character distinguishes Platymantis spileus from everything else in this tree. Flank spots on the body are present in this species and present in that one, but absent in these two. So flank spots distinguishes the new species from these two, Spileus and Paengi, but not from Insulatus, this one here. And so skin on dorsal folds on the, on the dorsum here, absent in the new species, but present in all the others. So this is a great character because it distinguishes your new species from all the relevant taxa. But you can see how um, the combination of these character states together will allow you to distinguish your new species from each of the relevant congeners. And that's, that's a great way to start a di diagnosis. If you have all that information already in one place, summarized, then you're ready to write your description. And you can do it by piecing together these things. You can say, body size distinguishes the new species from all its relevant closely related gen um, congeners. Toe discs distinguish it from Insulatus and Spileus, but not Pangi. Tubercles distinguish it from Spileus and Paengi. Flank spots distinguish it from Spileus and Paengi. Dorsal skin folds distinguish it from everything. And you can just go through that and lay it all out, and it's perfectly clear if you, if you um, describe your characters in terms of things that you can score as present or absent. So here's some examples, and I'm just going to provide a couple of these, and I'm not going to go over them in great depth. Here's a really simple one from a paper we, publ we published 15 years ago that shows you just that. See how I've just scored everything as pluses and minuses? That's all you need. It's pretty low tech. A couple of these can be described in qualitative terms, some of these characters, but the bulk of them can be, can be uh, described in terms of things that are present or absent, and that's really all you need. Here's a big one, right? This is me summarizing all the data. Oh, so I guess the things I want to point out here, again, we've talked multiple times about how do you define that universe of most of relevant taxa. In this case, I was comparing uh, a new species of frog to the morphologically similar species in the genus. Just the frogs that were clearly morphologically the same, that had the same physical characteristics. In this case, I was comparing this new species to all the species in this, all the other species in the genus. And in this example, I compared a new species of gecko to all the other Philippine members of the genus. So I narrowed down the, the, the universe of possibilities by, in those cases, focusing on things that were morphologically similar, the other species in the same genus, or in this case, just the other Philippine members of, the, of, the, of that same genus. So it's all about how you define your universe of possibilities. So this is where you should start. Make yourself a table and come up with, make a list of your species that you think is relevant and make a list of the characters. And as you go, the more you look at specimens, you'll add a couple additional characters to your table. And there's nothing wrong with doing that because as you look at them and as you focus on these characters, you're gonna start to see other ones. And that's exactly the process here. Here's, here, finally, I just want to say that, you know, I think it's great to, to be honest about the variation that you see and try to dis make design characters that, are, that hold across all the variation. And I put this figure in here to remind us of the variation that we might see in our sample. These are all males. You can see these individuals here. See how they differ th from the female? The female is much more slender. The thickness of the tail at the base right here, these thin legs in instead of these big thick legs. Her the female arms. tail curls the other way. The female tail curls in the wrong direction. Exactly. <laughs> it's backwards. See how the difference, uh, see the difference with the, um, the juvenile? The juveniles have banding, and then as they become adults, they lose that bright coloration. And the, the juveniles don't even have tails. Um, so <laughs> 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 so um, I think it's great to be honest about the variation and show it. And if you're honest about the variation and show it to the reader and to the people who evaluate your paper, your paper they won't have suspicions about whether your species is valid because they can see for themselves. They can count the scales themselves. All that information can be illustrated basically with just some, um, with just some half decent photography. And a lot of that photography you can take with cell phone cameras nowadays. I mean, it's, there's nothing special about that photograph except their specimens laid out on a black background. So it's pretty low tech.